welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. My name is Noceba Southern and I am a member of the Columbus Metropolitan Club's Board of Trustees and it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Today's forum, Existential Threats to Freedom of Speech, is Humor the First Casualty. It is brought to us with the support of Puffin Foundation West and in partnership with Cartoon Crossroads Columbus and the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. They are represented here today by many friends and associates. Won't you please help me thank them? American cartoonists have a unique protection under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which other cartoonists around the world do not. However, it is not a complete protection. The First Amendment reads in part that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free speech thereof, free exercise thereof, or, or, or abridging the free speech or of the freedom of press. This means cartoonists cannot be silenced by the government. However, as you'll hear from our panelists, it does not protect against other forces, such as social media mobs, political correctness, and or supporters of people in power. From the front lines and the front pages of the news of our world, please welcome Pulitzer Prize finalists and syndicated editorial cartoonists, formerly of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Rob Rogers, Overseas Press Club of America Award winner, former editorial cartoonist of the New York Times, and who currently works for various European newspapers, Patrick Chapati. Yeah. Pulitzer Prize winner and syndicated editorial cartoonist, formerly of the Houston Chronicle, and who currently works with the Washington Post Writers Group, Nick Anderson. and our host, journalist, formerly of the Columbus Dispatch, Tim Farron. <laughs> Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start by offering a little anecdote about why I think today's discussion is much needed, and we'll get the discussion rolling off of that comment. Uh, I've never been an uh, editorial cartoonist or graphic columnist as some people call it. I have been a columnist, though. I was a television critic for a while, and I got a lot of calls and letters, as you guys do, people complaining about what I'd have in the column. One day I got a, a, a call from a very angry man who went on and on and on, and I finally said, well, thanks for calling and venting your opinion. And he said, that's not why I called. I said, Okay, well then why did you call? And he said, I want you to stop injecting your opinion into your column. <laughs> and after I stopped laughing, I said, you understand that's the point of a column. Thanks for calling and hung up. So I just kind of wonder if, if this is something that you've run into that people don't understand there's a real difference between reporting news and giving your opinion in an editorial cartoon. Has this been something that you've run across at all? All the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've, I've gotten yeah. calls from readers who say, you know, how can you draw the president like that? And this is about every president that I've ever drawn, starting with Reagan, you know. Sure. So, so uh, they don't really understand that that's part of the deal, that you make fun of the president. And, and then other people will call and say, you know, well, why don't you make fun of the Democrats the way you make fun of the Republicans? You know, and I say, well, you know, <laughs> I do, but just not as much. Uh, so yeah, they, they, don't, they don't get that it's, it's my opinion and it's uh, expressed through the cartoon. 
you know, people call or email and accuse me of bias or where's the objectivity? <laughs> it's absurd. The, it's an editorial cartoon. The entire reason it exists is for opinion. It wouldn't even be effective if it was it's aspiring to objectivity. You'd put it through the Dulatron. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The Dulatron. Uh, usually people, when they want to complain, they, they call the editor. Mm -hmm. That's bizarre. They never call the cartoonist. Mm. So it's usually That's through the right. editor that you get the feedback. But shouldn't we be a little worried because we are three cartoonists uh, talking about freedom of speech, and all of us were introduced today as former, yeah. formerly, <laughs> yeah. former. Yeah. I think that says a lot about the state of satire and actually the conversation we're going to have today. Mm -hmm. yep. So then what's more dangerous to us as journalists and opinion guys, totalitarians, timid editors, or capitalists who are trying to cut the bottom line and get rid of writers and cartoonists? All of them. All three, huh? All of them. I mean, but, but you know, we can't really compare, at least I can't compare what, what I've been through to what's happened to, like, the cartoonists in Syria or in Iran or something like that. So, you know, these people have, you know, suffered bodily harm and, and imprisonment and real censorship. Um, so, so that's different. I mean, I, I do think we can't, we can't forget about that, that, that we do... Absolutely. Live in a democracy here, at least for the time being, <laughs> and and you know, and we do still enjoy those freedoms. Yeah, there are some cartoonists around the world that have shown extraordinary courage in the mm -hmm. face of uh, of their own uh, threats to their lives and well well being. And we at least we we may not have our jobs, but we still get to say what we want and mm -hmm. just don't not, maybe not able to pay our bills as well. But. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. So the threats. Uh, I fielded a few threats in my time. Somebody tried to uh, threaten me with, I was going to be a cellmate of Ted Koppel in Guantanamo. <laughs> what about you? What's the most dangerous or ludicrous threat you've ever received? Because I'm sure you've all gotten them, yes? Uh, someone told me, go have barbecue with uh, Saddam Hussein. And uh, <laughs> another guy found out I was living in Geneva, which is the case now. I'm living in Geneva. I lived in New York and Los Angeles. But no. And he said, keep on doing your stupid little nasty cartoons in your little gay country. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> but uh, the, I mean, you, you went through a list which is not ex extensive. I mean, the threats facing, I mean, this profession of political cartooning is facing many challenges today. Yeah from political pressure, which has been the case all over history, and we know that very well. Mm -hmm. And it's back full time in this day and age with uh, a president that has followers that are very, um, very active, and, and, and he has basically an army that is ready to go after, after you. Um, from, uh, you know, the, the economical pressure that the newspaper industry has faced, and uh, that the result of that, of that is editors who are very cautious, they don't want to get into trouble, mm -hmm. and uh, so they, they, they're going to be very timid, and, and they don't want to have troublemakers uh, like cartoonists. You have the threats from extremists, and we have seen what happened uh, in, uh, with Charlie Hebdo in Paris a few years ago, which was basically the most extreme form of censorship, killing. They got killed yeah. because they drew cartoons in the end. And you have now the, 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 the new threat of, uh, of uh, through social media, but of uh, uh, political correctness. And the question you ask is really, uh, are we still living in a world where we can have humor, or we can have political satire? Uh, because humor and satire, they need freedom. Does freedom need humor? I think that's really the question we are asking. Do we hold these values, the values of, of you know, political um, uh, uh, satire? Do we, do we hold humor as essential? And if yes, we should be worried, because right now, uh, political correctioning is being tested like, like never before. Yeah, you talked about the economic vulnerability of newspapers, and, and as a result of it, the economic vulnerability, editors don't feel as bold about protecting their cartoonists. And I think as a result, when they keep hearing the, all the screaming readers, they may feel like this really isn't worth it anymore. Uh, I've been protecting this cartoonist for years. I'm not sure it's worth the trouble. And I think that 
a lot of the cartoonists who've lost their jobs you know, in the last decade or, so, decade or so, it's not just economic. I think it's partly economic and partly political. Interesting. Uh, political correctness you mentioned, is, is that as much a danger as the, the top three things we mentioned, or is that just sort of the background noise that we've always dealt with as journalists? I mean, I do think that it, it, political correctness has taken on a, a, a new life of its own in terms of it's now, it's now a term that can be used by you know, either side for political purposes. I mean, the right set, uses it to, to sort of demean the left, you know, and, and I think the left can use it to you know, maybe censor things too. So, I mean, but, but I, do think that, I, I do think that what Patrick was saying and what Nick was saying was right, that that publishers and, and editors um, are getting a lot of pressure to, for this political correctness. So, so even in the case of a, of a cartoon, like with the cartoon, I mean, I'm sure we're going to get to this, but uh, the cartoon that that um, that ended up you leading to you being fired from the from the New York Times International Edition wasn't even your cartoon, but it was it was a cartoon that was immediately panned, and you know nobody really stopped to think well. You know, is this really uh, an anti-Semitic cartoon or not? And and so I think that, but but as soon as somebody said it, then everybody jumped on it and said that that you know it was anti-Semitic. And I and I'm not saying it was or it wasn't. I'm just saying that that immediately led to you know uh, intolerance of that cartoon and cartoons altogether. So so it can be it can be dangerous. Yeah. Do you want to talk more about the, that experience? I could go on uh, <laughs> please, for no, hours please on that. But uh, yeah, what you mentioned, well, we're not going to show that cartoon. You can find it and, and, it, was a, and make it was on the screen. Antonio's uh, cartoon? Yeah, yeah, they showed it. OK, yeah. so there was a cartoon by a Portuguese colleague, very well-known Portuguese cartoonist, uh, very respected in Portugal. And it was a syndicated cartoon. It was uh, picked by an editor. So it was a choice by the New York Times. And they printed it. and then. They got a big, big, big uproar. Um, very quickly, it seemed to be focused on you know, Fox News, Breitbart, and the usual suspects, which are not the friends of the New York Times. Right. But what happened, and I couldn't believe it, uh, I've been working for the New York Times for first the Herald Tribune and then the New York Times for 18 years. And I know you're going to be shocked to hear that the New York Times had cartoons. Plus, they had a cartoonist with a, with a French accent. That's really <laughs> shocking to you. But they did. Not only the international edi edition, but over the last years, the website and social right. media. Right. Yeah. So they were having cartoons, in, uh, political cartoons. But um, what happened is uh, the way they dealt with uh, that uh, um, storm, not, not to use a bad word, uh, was really amazing because they let the attackers define the conversation. And, and this raises the question of, of the traditional media uh, uh, dealing with social media. Because they got, they got a huge storm that built up on social media. Was it organized in some parts? Uh, you, know, uh, you, can, you can guess that uh, pe some, people were very, some groups were very happy to, to put oil on, on, on the flames. But that was, a, and that happened to other cartoonists here in the room. Uh, their, uh, their editors were faced with the similar uh, social media mobs, the moralistic mobs, and they gather and they, 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 they fall upon newspapers uh, in, an, in, in a blow. It comes from all sides, and, and editors are just not prepared to deal with that. Mm -hmm. They freak out. They freak out. So that's, that raised the big question of the relationship between media and social media. And we need to remember, editors need to remember that social media is not their readers. It's not their audience, not necessarily their right. audience. Right. And they need to be ready for that kind of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And we need to push back. Also, as individuals, uh, we need to, when we see these moralistic crowd gather and, and you know, it's, it's good or evil. There is no discussion. There's, Twitter is not a place for discussion. And Rob had a similar experience a little over a year ago. I mean, I'd I think the audience would love to hear about your experience. Do. That's yeah. OK, well, I, I was, I was going to share an experience I had where a cartoon was called anti-Semitic. I ended up losing a freelance job because of that. But that's a different story. Uh, no, so what happened to me was um, 
I was working at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, was there for 25 years, and, um, and the publisher of the paper was the same guy, you know, for the whole time, uh, John Block, and, and in 2015, he made it known that he liked Trump, and, uh, and he was even hinting at a possible endorsement, and my editor at the time, had been my editor for 12 years, the editorial page editor, and he was a great guy. Always, you know, always worked with me every day. We we made the cartoons better, um, and and he was feeling pressure to endorse Trump, and he didn't want to do that. So he eventually, uh, there happened to be a buyout on the table when when he was putting the most pressure on him, and so he said, he called me up one day and said, Rob, I'm leaving. I'm sorry, <laughs> and I was like, no. Uh-oh. And I said, should I take the buyout? And he's like, I don't know, that's up to you. But uh, I, la I lasted another two years, but eventually um, uh, they did begin to make changes to the editorial page. They, they, um, uh, he brought in uh, the editorial uh, page editor in Toledo who took over uh, both papers. Uh, and then, and he was sort of brought in, I think, I mean, this is just my conjecture because they really didn't talk to me that much about it, but uh, my conjecture is that they brought him in to, to kind of get me in line to do more, you know, softer cartoons about Trump. It wasn't like they were asking me to, you know, do positive cartoons, but they, but they would rather I didn't do any, or, or, or if I did ones, they would be sort of just nice, you know. Um, <laughs> which I couldn't do. I mean, I just really couldn't do it. I woke up every morning, you know, angry at, at Trump and needed to say something about it. So, but I didn't do it every day. I mean, we, we agreed that, you know, Trump every day is, you know, gets old. So, so, um, so I would, you know, I would sort of space them out during the week. Um, but anyway, the, the new editor started to crack down on my cartoons and, um, and whereas I knew the publisher wasn't happy with everything I was doing before, he wasn't killing them, but now the new editor started killing them. And so normally I would have one or two cartoons killed a year, and, um, and in the space of three months I had 18 cartoons killed. So, um, and I think we've all dealt with killed cartoons. You know, mine were mostly about the Catholic Church, you know, because it's a very Catholic city, Pittsburgh, and. And, um, and, the, and the publisher was tired of hearing from the, from the bishop who would call him up every time the cartoon would run. So he'd, he'd say, could, you know, one time, this actually happened. He, he came to me after that, after the, the bishop called him and said, could you draw Benedict without those dark circles, you know? Uh, <laughs> he, said, he said, the bishop said, you're making him look like Uncle Fester, you know? <laughs> and I was like, well. If the know, cassock fits, yeah, right. I guess, right? So, so it's not like we didn't have, we didn't have this, this discussion about other cartoons, but it, it suddenly took on a very heightened level when it came to Trump. And then, and then the final six cartoons in a row that were killed, weren't just about Trump, they also dealt with race, um, race issues. And so, and so it made me think that, you know, it was more than just, just that one topic. So, um, but anyway, they, they, they offered me, uh, for, first of all, they, they sort of, you know, killed six in a row and I, and so I took vacation days to, to, till they would be willing to talk to me and they, and they, they never did, but then they ended up having me come in to meet with the, uh, personnel department and, and to go over a contract that they wanted me to sign. And, uh, and it was, you know, we can get into more details later, but it wasn't a good contract. So I said no. And then a, a week later, they, they laid me off. So if I could riff off that for a second. Please do. So I, Rob's firing made international news and people, yeah. as it should have, and, and a lot of people, were in, Hollywood celebrities were tweeting about it, yeah. and it was Harvard on CNN. Tweeted something Ironically, like it was in the New York Times. Yeah. Uh, right. Ironically. <laughs> right. Well, I have, a, I have a funny story about that too, but I'll we'll wait. We'll get back to that. Yeah. Right. So I got angry, because I'm like, everyone's so angry about Rob's firing, and they should be, but this has been happening for decades. Yeah. Cartoonists have been sil getting silenced for decades and nobody knows about it because it was done quietly. Rob's editor and publisher were kind of dumb enough to do it in a ham-fisted way. Um, and so I wrote a column that ended up landing in CNN.com about this, about how cartoonists have been getting silenced for decades. And as a result, I got a, contacted by a, a, a venture capitalist who wanted to start a website for cartoonists. And we, it took a while to get going, but we started something called CounterPoint. Uh, which is a newsletter, it's an email newsletter, it's a free newsletter, 
And the theory is that we have an equal number of liberal and conservative cartoonists each time. We're honest about our biases, um, but we're arguing together. And the theory is that hopefully, if we're not in our silos, in our separate media environments, we'll maybe be able to start talking to each other again. And so it's a free newsletter, and this gives you an idea of the appetite for what we do. And the only complaint we've had from our founder is, why are you all playing it so safe? Yeah. <laughs> He said, are you all like, you're like a bunch of whipped dogs after, <laughs> after working for newspaper ads. Family editors. newspapers, we've worked so for we started taking, newspapers. Yeah, we started taking more chances and doing more edgy work, and this gives you an idea of the appetite for what we do. In mid-June, we had 1,000 subscribers. Today, we have 130,000 subscribers. Wow. We're, we're growing at 10,000 a week. It's like, it's just going gangbusters. And so it's counterpoint. Com? It's well. We just bought the rights for Counterpoint.com okay. this week. Okay. It's if you go to uh, yourCounterpoint.com uh, right now, it'll, you can get signed up that way. Um, and so uh, it's it's going very well. And we think by uh, next year we'll be uh, self-sustaining through advertising, free uh, free newsletter. That's something. I was going to ask if you thought online publication was a blessing or a curse, but apparently we just answered that question. It, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, social media, I, I, you, right. know, it's, you can't monetize what happens on social media. Yeah. And people take our cartoons like crazy. Oh, yeah. Our yeah. stuff is seen more now than it ever was, and yet we can't monetize it. Uh, people copy and paste it. I'll, I've seen my cartoons shared hundreds of thousands of times. One cartoon shared like half a million times and yet I couldn't make a dime off of it. Uh, I'm sure you all have had the same experience. So social media ex expands our voice, but it just kills us economically. But that's where we're, the one thing about CounterPoint is we're paying cartoonists for original work. You can't see it anywhere else first. So if you want to see the cartoon, you have to subscribe. Now they'll get taken and they'll get po posted on Facebook and whatever, but at least if you want to see it first, you see it there, and we're paying for original work. It's not recycled syndicated work. Yeah. Rob's one of our cartoonists. Rob's one of our cartoonists. Nate Beeler, hometown guy, is one of our cartoonists. This guy, I'm working on him. <laughs> Nate was, uh, along with myself, we were laid off in May from the dispatch. So, yeah. good. I'm glad he's, uh, he's yeah. got a gig lined up. What, what I've been, what I've been uh, sort of impressed with is, you know, there, there are many cartoons in the, in the collection that I don't agree with and, and, you know, and I would never sort of, I would never sort of think, oh, this is something I would run on my Facebook page, but, but it's fun to do it and just get reader response and man, they really do respond. But, but the other day, I mean, I saw a Nate Beeler cartoon and I was like, damn, I wish I'd thought of that. Because mm -hmm. the funny thing is, you know, even the conservatives have days when they go after Trump too. I mean, because yeah. he's not really a conservative. So, so there's been some weird overlap. And then, and then we have Ted Rawls as one of the cartoonists and he'll often go after the Democrats. So sometimes you'll see the Republicans going after, you know, the, the conservatives going after Trump and, and Ted going after the Democrats. So. Yeah. We don't have an editor. We, we edit each other, and that was our, one of our founders' in, insistence. We're not going to have an editor. You do whatever you want, but we keep a check on each other, and we send, each, we send out sketches. And there have been a couple times where somebody said, uh, hey, I think that device you're using is, might cause more trouble than it's worth, and they, we end up changing it. Yeah. But it's done kind of as a team. It's really a novel approach. And it's like it, we've decoupled our fates from newspapers this way, and we're working as a team, which has never been done before. Uh, it's yeah. funny, I've always had a little trouble with that definition of being a, a conservative or yeah. you know, Republican right. Democratic right. cartoonist. I mean, you're a cartoonist. You're supposed to look at the world sure. with two eyes, you know, not like this <laughs> or like that. You're supposed to look at the world with two eyes and 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 uh, and, uh, and and you know speak truth to power, whatever who's ever is in in power, and you don't have to be a conservative to necessarily or be a progressive uh, to see that, uh, for example, maybe the current president has some uh, ego maniac issues. I don't know. It's <laughs> so it's good that there is an exchange, but that that should be part of the. 
our own job is to so look at any, yeah, any sign. Thing, is that with counterpoint, you're, you're, we have three and three each day, but you're free to say whatever you want. There's no yeah. prescribed balance. Like if Ted goes after the Democrats a lot, and you know, if I want to go after the Democrats, or if some of the conservatives, like Nate, went after Trump this week. So yeah, you're free to say whatever you want. That's so, the way it should be. So that debate whether a cartoon is, is truthful or in bad taste, or whatever, uh, is that part of how the system is going to work for you, or do you think that really kind of is 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 keeping the wraps on you? I mean, should free speech be just let her rip and who cares? Yeah, that's a good question. That's kind of a personal uh, decision, you know, based on yeah. all of our personal taste and our personal level for how far we want to go. But, but I do think that, um, you know, not working for a newspaper, you can do more. You can actually do more. But, but I also miss the uh, the structure and the and the edit. You know, having an editor that could steer me away from something that you know maybe w could be better, or you know, it could could you know or you know, I, you know I, he, my editor used to say, well, you can't say that or you can't say that, but then he would also tell me, you know, that's not your best work. And, and he, he said, it's fine, we'll run it, mm -hmm. it's not your best work. Of course, I will always go back and do something else because I was like, not my best work, you know. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, and, and I miss that, but, but yeah, there is more freedom, definitely, and, um, and, and I, I, do think, I do think it's important to push push the boundaries as much it's as we can. It's good that you are recreating a space of conversation because I would miss that space. Mm -hmm. It's true that uh, the history of political cartooning has been linked with the history of the press, and especially the history of a free press and, 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 uh, and the history of democracy. There is no political cartoonist in China, for example. Think about it, not a single one. Um, and, and, and being part of a media is being part of a conversation. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the political cartoon can bring a counterpoint to, to, the, to the official line of the newspaper, and that's, that's always an interesting thing. And it's to have that exchange. So it's good that you are recreating that with the website. Trying to. Yeah, I, I agree. I miss that. And I, I have a good editor at my syndicate who tells me that, like, you, yeah. can, you can do better. Yeah. And there are times, it's, even after 30 years of doing this, I'm still uncertain of myself. I'll be like, I think this is a really good cartoon, but is it? And then she'll be like, it's not that good. Or I'll think things are bad, and she'll be like, this is really strong. Yeah. I'm it's, still uncertain of myself. So have you ever gone back and looked at that and said, I don't know why they said that. That was not good. That was fantastic. Or <laughs> do you always agree with that in hindsight? Not always. It, it, time definitely helps, um, especially now that my memory stinks. Six months later, I don't remember what I drew, and I look at it, and I'm like, oh, that was actually better than I thought, because you see it with fresh yeah. eyes. Yeah. Um, and like sometimes I'll fall in love with a thought process, like the creative process was so novel, I think this must be brilliant, because it took three hours to think of, and then <laughs> six months later, I'm like, that really didn't make much sense. <laughs> I, I've had an experience with, it, with an old editor um, at the paper where, where he killed something that I did. It was. Um, it was, it was about Republicans um, and, and the abortion issue, and a woman was standing there talking to a congressman saying, um, saying, you know, you, you, you have so much to say about my womb, well, what about the rest of me? And he says, nice legs, you know? <laughs> and, and, and so the, uh, the editor said, no, it's a family newspaper, we can't run, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't showing anything, but so then later that year, uh, I, I'm, I'm laying out some cartoons for the, for the contest entry, and I decided to get his opinion. And so, you know, I'm, all these copies of the cartoons, and he says, oh, I love this one. You gotta put this one in there. And it was, I said, really, really? And, and I said, you killed it. And he's, <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, you know, he's like, what do I know? <laughs> so, so yeah, it happens, I mean. It's, it's, it's also what, what they're going through that day. You never know what's on their mind, what, what some reader might have called in and complained right. about something, sure. and so they, so they say, you know. Ask, yeah. stop putting your opinion in your commentary. Right, yeah. right. 
<laughs> I think the fundamental question uh, that is being raised is the, the question of freedom that yeah. we have. So you created a new space of freedom, and each time a curtainist is let go, it's a space for freedom that closes. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an interesting uh, time now, because we need to wonder, uh, do, we love, do we still love freedom enough? Are we still ready to fight for things like the right to, like humor, and, and, and the right to criticize yeah. an opinion? And, and, uh, I have, so you understand I have one foot in, in Europe, one foot in the US. And when you look at the US, you have that wonderful first amendment, you have that notion that this is a, this is a country where freedom of speech is absolutely guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Whereas in France, for example, the law, the press law in France, they are much more, they limit you know, what you can say and tell, you, you, have, you have the possibility to go after uh, a story, to go after a cartoonist, you have the notion of insulting a group uh, based on their religion, on their race, you have all that in the law. But the question is, of course in the United States you have that protection of the, the towering First Amendment, mm -hmm. but the, the, what is the reality of it? Uh, how is the reality of freedom of speech in society? And that's a paradox, because you have the feeling that here in the United States, and that's reflect, reflected through the media, mm -hmm. through what happened to you and to you and to, and to me, in a way, um, the space, the, the, the real space for freedom, which is what is possible in society, defined by politics, by the media, by you know, the, the, the moral standards, is actually getting narrow, uh, narrower and narrower. And, and, so are and, people more, that, more inclined to get offended here and more narrow-minded and more resistant to? Well, there is this evolution, we alluded to that. Mm -hmm. We live in, in, in an era where you know, anything, any cartoon can offend someone. Yeah. And we tend to, to, uh, to confound things. I mean, a, a, a criticism is not an offense. Uh, a joke is not, is not an attack. Mm -hmm. And people get, tend to get offended, and, and, and now we have social media which, which are amplifier of outrage, and they have a, an incredible power to, yes, create reactions and put pressure on the media, all that born out of outrage, offense, um, by people, individuals, and groups. So we need to think about that. What, what's happening there? Mm -hmm. We'll take one uh, uh, moment here. We're gonna move to audience questions in just a few minutes. So start thinking about that and step up to the microphone right over there. Don't be shy. But I'm going to get in one final question here and let these guys chew over this. So tastes do change with the times. Back when Thomas Nast drew cartoons, yeah, I, as someone with Irish ancestry, would have been portrayed <laughs> as a knuckle-dragging ape. So I doubt that would make it into print today. In 50 or 100 years, is one of your colleagues going to be considered as crazy and questionable as Thomas Nast is today? <laughs> I feel like we're playing it pretty safe right now. Yeah. But yeah, that's one of those questions where is political science bad or political uh, correctness bad or is it good? I mean, yeah. that's progress to me that that's considered uh, out, out, out of the bounds. And there are many images, racial stereotypes that should be out of bounds and are. And I'm not going to complain about political correctness because of that. That to me is a, is a good thing. Um, I don't know. Do you all have some, some thoughts on that? I mean, I do think that. Yeah, I mean, the, the things have shifted. I mean, I remember, I remember as a kid watching uh, Mr. Magoo, and he had his, you know, Charlie, his, his, you know, Asian helper, and it was, so, it was so racist when you look back at it. But at the time, I was like, you know, and the Warner Brother cartoons during World War II. So those now seem really uh, beyond, the, beyond the pale to us yeah. now. But at the time, you know, so things are changing. So who knows? Maybe, yeah, maybe in the future. Um, maybe, you know, 
drawing uh, a president with an orange face will, will be like, you know, <laughs> deemed, you know, very unacceptable. He might like it yeah. to be tomorrow. For that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But anyway, Patrick, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, I guess uh, it's, it's true that uh, the form of humor has evolved. We are evolving with society. Mm -hmm. That is normal. It's a, you know, it's a relationship. But, but then the question is, how far do we want to go? <laughs> that, that's the whole question, I guess. So uh, uh, censorship in general, and, and specifically, it seems like all three of you guys have been censored in some way or another for something that you had drawn. Have you ever been censored, I guess is maybe the wrong word, but somehow censored for not drawing something. Maybe Rob is yeah. the best example. Yeah, and, I, and, and let me just make a distinction. I mean, I, I, I've been on a couple panels where, you know, people have said, well, you know, they were censoring you. And, and you know, true censorship is, is government censorship. You know, the Post-Gazette was a private company, and they, they had every right to their, you know, their, they were actually protected by the First Amendment more than I was in that instance. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to their credit, they hired another cartoonist. Steve Kelly, who is more in line with their viewpoint now. And, you know, that would have been a much easier sell for them to just say, hey, we're changing the editorial page, you know, and here's your severance, you know. But, yeah. but they, you know, they, they, instead they tried, to, they tried to get me to change what I was doing and, and to change. So, so uh, one panel I was on with an ACLU um, um, worker, she said, she said that, or a lawyer, she said, you know, it's, it's sort of the difference between hard censorship and soft censorship. So hard censorship would be to, you know, the government sends you to prison for drawing cartoons about the president. Soft censorship is when either corporations or, or um, you know, people with political influence start to, you know, censor things. And, and that's sort of what happened to me is that, is that it just changed. And so instead of, a, you know, instead of having the same freedom of, you know, my opinion that I had on the page, that, that, that was different. Because even, you know, even all those 25 years, they never came to me and said, we need you to write something you know, different. Mm -hmm. They always let me do my own thing. So it was a shock when that changed. But it wasn't, it wasn't officially censorship, really, I mean. Well, in my case, um, to finish the New York Times story, so what happened, uh, you, had, you, had, you had the big, uh, outcry over that cartoon and they dealt with that and uh, and one month after that they sent me a note saying that they were ending my contract and thus they were uh, stopping political cartoons altogether so that means losing my job for a cartoon I didn't do but that also means renouncing giving up on a whole genre political cartoons um, because something went wrong with one cartoon. So that's a, a whole new thing. Yeah. We just invented self preventive self-censorship. Right. <laughs> and that is, that is something. The only experience I have similar is, is not so much political, but my editor in Houston was always trying to give me bad ideas. <laughs> and, and would never, we had editorial conferences twice a week and every meeting he would make a joke about, oh wait, I can't give you ideas. And so <laughs> for 10 years I had to listen to this. <laughs> so, and the, the, our ideas are very personal and so people get upset, like especially if you have an editor that's trying to give you ideas and they're always jokey and it's not an opinion, it's a joke. It's something you might see on, on you know, late night TV. Um, and I don't take other people's ideas because that's the voice. Um, it's a very personal thing. And people always tell me, you know, you don't have to give me credit, you don't have to do, do anything. No, I don't want to take your idea. That's your idea. Um, you all probably yeah. feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I made the mistake once early in my career of, of this guy called me, you know, like a bunch of times. and. and and he, or he called me one time and he said, I have this idea. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't really take ideas. And he said, well, here it is. And it was this idea, uh, you know, that, that you know, there were, there were terrorists hijacking airplanes at the time. This was in the 80s. And so he said, what if, you know, you know what if you had, like, the, instead of selling insurance, they're selling, you know, bulletproof vests. And I said, well, that's kind of an interesting, interesting idea. I changed it into, 
you know, the seat cushion in front of you could be used, or under, you know, under your seat could be used as a bulletproof vest. Got into the Washington Post and, and made, you know, got syndicated and, uh, and so then the guy called me every week and that was the only good idea he had. And so, and so I said, you know what, never again. Right. I'm not, and, and, right. and I really did. I, I realized at that point that pretty much what Nick was saying is that, you know, it has to be your own, your own voice. And it also, so it he also. He didn't want money. <laughs> no, he didn't want money. He just wanted to keep calling me and giving me more ideas. So, yeah. So, and it is, it is much easier to say to, to say to somebody that's, Part of my job description, I get paid to come up with the idea. So thank you very much, but I can't. Anyway, other people have bad ideas. Yes. Professional, <laughs> professional use only, don't try this at home. So it's the Metropolitan Club's tradition, of course, to take audience questions. We'd like you to come up, state your name, ask your question, and avoid, sorry, editorial comments. <laughs> Place your question in the form of a question. I'm not Alex Trebek. And so, <laughs> let's get started. Dick. Thank you. I'm Richard Burnett. I'm the rector of Trinity Episcopal Church across the river. Uh, in the late October 2001, the New Yorker had a small cartoon. It had a picture of a person walking on the street by a bookstore, and a sign was down, and it said, the sign said, 50% less irony. <laughs> um, I used that actually in the Christmas Eve sermon that year, and I looked up the idea of irony, and one of the things I found that, that I think is really helpful is that irony is a way for people to be connected to each other because they've suffered or they, they're in on, the, in on the joke, in on the joke. I wonder if one of the struggles with, not to pick on editors and newspapers, but one of the pr pr problems is the newspapers, frankly, are so disconnected and people are so unsubscribed and we're so sort of atomistic that we don't have the capacity to be in on anything. That is a question. It sounds like a speech. It is a question. <laughs> so, so really it has to do with what's the purpose of irony for building community in a community-less environment? Hmm. That's such a smart question, I need time to process it. <laughs> I, I think it's true. I think you do have to, being in and out, you have to have a community. And I worked in two newspapers. One was in Louisville, Kentucky, which is a very strong sense of community, very strong sense of, very civic-minded. And then Houston, which is more atomized. People are from all over the place. People aren't, weren't as engaged with the newspaper. And I didn't enjoy the job in Houston nearly as much. I loved the job in Houston, in Louisville, because everybody paid attention to the newspaper. Everybody was engaged. People either loved my work or they hated it, which was exactly the way I wanted it. In Houston, they just they didn't necessarily pay attention because they weren't necessarily taking the newspaper, which was very, very frequently the case. I think that's a, a, an interesting insight. Uh, uh, speaking of. Um, uh, commentary and humor and so forth. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, wondered if, I've talked to a number of uh, uh, comedians, interviewed them, and they're always saying, especially the political ones, you always want to punch up rather than punching down. In other words, you're trying to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Is that something that enters your mind when you're putting together a cartoon? It, it does for me. I mean, I, I definitely think that way. and and. And you know when when readers would come to me and say, well, why aren't you you know why aren't you using that same energy towards the Democrats or towards their policies? And and I you know I would say, well, because they want to you know the things that they're trying to do, like you know give health care to everybody and you know and and feed the hungry and and you know house people. I mean, those are things that I believe in. So um, so for me, it's easier. To you know, to, to draw from that perspective, and and then it sort of goes to what you were saying about we're not really liberals or conservatives, but sometimes those issues are pretty you know far apart in terms of in terms of where we start out. So there is a line. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, right. yes. uh, my name is uh, Guy Bado. I'm cartoonist in Ottawa. French language paper. Uh, my question is: Has Donald Trump ever complained about a cartoon? that was drawn in the US? That's a question for the room. Yeah, I, and if not, why not? 
that really galls he, me because well, he, he doesn't read. He doesn't yeah. read. So uh, <laughs> we have words in our cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> But see uh, how he picked the, how Trump picked the timing of the Ukrainian scandal. It's happening today, and you have a hundred cartoonists having dinner and, <laughs> and, and not working on on the, right. on the scandal. Yeah, very clever of him. Indeed. I mean, very I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that he hasn't like targeted somebody. But he did. He did invite. Wasn't it Garrison to the White House? Was it Ben Garrison? Mm -hmm. the, the sort of, you know, well right-wing um, conspiracy theory cartoonist, uh, I think is a kind way of saying it. But, um, but I, as far as I know, that's the first time he's ever mentioned a cartoonist. Uh, and then, you know, and then when he got, when he got all the flack for it, he, he disinvited him, so. I, I was trying so hard to get blocked by him on Twitter. I, I yeah. was <laughs> constantly insulting him. And it's one of my failures as a, as a cartoonist, <laughs> but I know. <laughs> Hey, I'm Jay Thrasher. Um, I'm also a political cartoonist. So we've talked a lot about um, political correctness here and how it's censoring cartoons. But um, I've noticed the political correctness card is usually only played in cartoons that rely on like bigoted tropes as the joke. So um, how do we know that it's actually political correctness that's censoring? cartoons or that these bigoted tropes just aren't funny anymore and aren't like seen as good ideas in contemporary society? Fair question. Mm -hmm. I think political correctness is whatever people define as what they don't like. Um, it, and that is why it's hard to respond to the question because it's, it's, it's an amorphic, uh, uh, it's hard to define. Um, and that is the classic definition, at least in, in, the last, in our current era. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Do you all have any uh, thoughts about that? And then uh, who gets to define what is uh, offending, what is a trope? Uh, I think there's a balance between freedom of, there's always been a balance between freedom of speech on one side, and on the other side, waiting more and more is the, uh, the feeling of the offended, uh, the claim of the offended to be heard, that was, that's normal, mm -hmm. but not only to be heard, but to be vindicated and to have the offender punished. And that balance to me seems to be shifting and that's what I see happening with the New York Times story and others where uh, they prefer to err on the side of caution and, and they prefer to give up on complicated things like irony, satire, because you get into that kind of discussions. This is insulting to someone. This might offend someone. So we're kind of losing the understanding of what irony is and how important it is for us as humans to deal with life and to deal with each other. Because actually humor, to me, is a very good tool to, to deal with conflicts. It's a conflict resolution mechanism. That's what humor is. Humor is, is not uh, uh, pushing, putting down the others. It's actually compassionate. We need humor to communicate. It's, it's, it's a part of the, of, the, of the conversation. And without humor, we're not, we're not discussing with each other. Yeah. I, just, just to finish off on that, I, w I would say to Jake's point, you know, that uh, that in the same way that you know, certain people use socialism as a way to insult people that care about the poor, uh, you know, I think political correctness is being used to, to sort of blanket uh, people that want to see bigoted tropes. You know? So, so um, you know, because they, they, can, they can blame that for uh, why it's not acceptable. Um, so yeah, I think that, that is, that, I'm seeing more of that on the internet now. Hey, I'm Jay, I'm a cat herder. Uh, as Ro as uh, Patrick noticed, there is a lot of formerlies in your titles. And going forward, I mean, right now, CounterPoint has, you know, you have a business plan, the NIB has a business plan, but where does journalism have a business plan? Because you have people crying out for news every single day, and they want it, and they're reading it online, and yet, so many of the news organizations are failing at their fundamental purpose. So where do you see journalism and where do you see publishing going forward in the 21st century? 
I wish I knew the answer to that. There, yes. why, why don't you answer the question? What do you think? Well, that is, a, that is the question of the day in the industry. Um, you know, it primarily ad and subscriber supported, uh, and um, it's just been going down and down. Everyone has been saying, oh, the future is online, and yet who's making any money off of online? Amazon, Google, and Facebook, not local newspapers. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to, but it's a rough go. So I'm not sure exactly where it ends. That's, that's the best I can do. I'm, I'm, of course, someone who was laid off as the dispatch is trying to continue its financial uh, 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 way, but um, good luck. Former Tom Susi, a former consumer investigative reporter in TV, nearly 30 years, the last nine here in Columbus, quit a few weeks, ago, a few months ago because of exactly what you're talking about, the viewers and spineless managers and companies and influential friends of general managers stopping good journalism, stopping stories that people need to read about and, and see on TV. He kind of dovetailed the two, what I wanted to ask you, but the future of being able to do your job and report the sort of stories that people need to be informed about in free speech. How do you see that future? Big question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's, I think that's beyond, that's above my pay grade, but uh, um, I, you know, I think that, you know, it, it's an important question for, you know, just to, just to talk about journalism in general, um, you know, the, the model isn't working anymore, newspapers, you know, that model, and I, I, I imagine TV is going through the same kind of thing, um, but they're doing a little bit better, I, I think, than, than newspapers, for sure. Um, one story I tell sometimes when I'm, when I'm doing these kinds of panels is that back in 1995, um, I did a, 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 an illustrated article for the New York Times, again, here we go with the New York Times, uh, but they wanted, because even back in the mid-90s, we, we were losing jobs, cartoonists were losing their jobs, and so they asked me to do this, this thing about, you know, with downsizing in newspapers and cartoonists losing their job, you know, what is the place of the cartoonist? So I did this sort of thing. But, that's how long it's been, you know, going on. I mean, uh, you know, almost, <laughs> almost from the moment I got a job, you know, people were worried about losing it. But, uh, but I don't have, yeah, I don't have the answer for how, how we keep our, our voices out there other than just, you know, using whatever platform there is, you know. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, it's nice to see, you know, CounterPoint and the Nib and other other things that are not the traditional model come along, and I. You know, I do see a lot of things that are more like public television where you have subscribers, and, and I think those kinds of things might be the future. I don't know. Yeah, but well, that's kind of the, the model. You know, the, the point is, you guys are handcuffed. You know, what I'm seeing is reporters, especially investigative reporters, they're handcuffed because of political correctness, advertisers pulling out, viewers complaining about a story because maybe their politics. I mean, this is affecting the very nature of journalism, the checks and balances. That's really what's at stake here, in my opinion. Yeah, true. But, but then there, there are many initiatives in, in the field of journalism and, and the media, uh, many different models being tried out, uh, backed by foundations, backed by uh, different sources of financing, and there is a lot of demand from the, the public, from the audiences, for good journalism, so I think the picture is not is not uh, bleak. We have time for one more question. Okay, hi, uh, hi guys. Liza Donnelly, editorial cartoonist with the New Yorker magazine. I hesitated to ask this question because I wasn't sure it was on topic, but I think it's deeply embedded in the topic because the great thing about free speech is that we get to hear from everybody. So, why is our community still struggling with diversity? Why are there not more? people of color in our field and women in our field. I'd like to <clears throat> hear from all of you. I'm, I, I'm asked that a lot because of, because of CounterPoint and because it's not just 
political diversity, but we like more diversity. And it's, as a cartoonist, when I was in Louisville, and cartooning was a bigger deal then, I would have cartoonists, con young cartoonists contact me all the time. And 95% of them are young and white males. And I don't understand that. I don't know if it's the way we socialize uh, young girls. I don't, I don't know, I don't completely understand it. You may have more insight than I do um, about, about this. Do you all have any thoughts? Well, I've, Liza, we've seen more and more uh, women in that, in that specific field um, in Europe, in the US, and that's really a very good sign. We, 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 we have a lot of women cartoonists now, so that, that's the first good evolution. Yeah, I, I, would say, I would say a lot is not, yeah, that, that's not a good, you know. Uh, no, well, not, not in, in this the, country. In the I mean, cartoonists, in, in, I see a good uh, representation of women. Yeah, and, and if you look at something like the Nib, um, there are more women cartoonists there than, than are actually, you know, sort of represented in our organization, you know, which is, um, which has always been, you know, <laughs> balding white guys, you know. <laughs> no, no offense to anybody that isn't balding, but. Uh, um, He's got plenty of But, you know, but it, you know, it is, it is something that is, has been noticed over the years, and we've had panel discussions about it, and I don't think anybody's quite figured it out. But, um, but yeah, I think we definitely need more diversity, and uh, we need more women, we need more people of color in, in this field, and then we might have a, a more diverse uh, set of opinions and, and set of values. Uh, so I think that's, that's really, it's an important thing to bring up, so thank you for mentioning it. I wish we had an answer. Well, I hope you found today's forum very insightful, informative, and provocative. And I would just say that as we contemplate on everything that we've heard today and the notion of freedom of speech and of press and in an era of social media and the worldwide world, World Wide Web and increasing access, what does that mean in terms of as we broaden our access, what does it mean in terms of our diminishing thoughts and our diminishing tolerance and how do we reconcile the two so that we can continue to promote freedom of speech and I would encourage you to talk about that as you have coffee and cookies. So I want to make sure that we thank again our sponsors, Puffin Foundation West, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, and especially Association of American Ed Editorial Cartoonists. We also again want to thank our speakers, Rob Rogers, Patrick Chapati, Nick Anderson, and Tim Farron. And thank all of you for coming out tonight, and we look forward to seeing you at our next CMC forum.